wife has been coming up with some amazing, amazing recipes uh, that are uh, quick and simple and most of all, incredibly heart healthy. So we hope that you enjoyed it tonight. And now you'll have an opportunity to see her demonstrate uh, how to prepare uh, what you just ate. So I'm going to turn the time over to Jan. Good evening. How many enjoyed your meal tonight? Good. All right. So I've had lots and lots of questions about where did you get those noodles and what did they have in them? So I got the, it's called Organic Forbidden Rice Ramen, and it's Lotus Foods Rice is Life. They're gluten-free and they're vegan. And the ingredients are black rice flour, organic brown rice, Oh, organic black rice flour, organic brown rice flour, and organic white rice flour. And we went, I, I found these noodles in, um, at Lassen's last Friday, and I thought, oh, they look perfect for what I want to use. And so um, we started looking at all, all the stores. I mean, Becky and I went to eight different stores yesterday and <clears throat> Lassen's had only two uh, two more packages of these and they have four cakes in each one and um, so, but you can buy them on the internet I just didn't do the searching soon enough to buy them on the internet and get them in bulk but um, you can get that, they have individual packets. They're a little bit more expensive, the individual packets. And you can get them at Sprouts. And um, I think we found some of the, the long spaghetti type noodles at Albertsons. Um, we did not find any at um, Stater Brothers. So um, anyway, I, I really, really liked them and I hope you liked them like them too. So we start with that and you take one of those rice, little rice ramen cakes and you split it between two bowls and it only, you only need to cook it for four minutes. So it's just really quick. And then you add the um, edamame on top And because um, this is your protein, and then um, take the, and again, you can use whatever vegetables you like. Um, this is kind of like a, a spring roll without the wrap, you know, the, the wraps on the bottom, you know, just the noodles. And you cut your cucumber up so that it's kind of long, little spots like this, kind of bite size, and you put half of them in each. And the recipe that I got this from was from the Forks Over Knives cookbook. It didn't ask for red cabbage, but I like to, as much as possible, eat the rainbow and um, raw is good for you. It's really healthy, and so most of this is raw. Um, the edamame, you can buy pre-cooked, frozen, at Trader Joe's, and it, you only need to put it in the boiling water for four minutes, and that's what I use, so that makes that really easy. So we put the cabbage in there, and then we like a little bit of green onion, and maybe some of you don't, but I like the green onion. So slice some of that real quick. And depending on how much you want, you put that over it. And then you take the snow peas, and I just t take off the ends, and 
if the string comes a little bit with it, then I just take the string off. And then I also just um, went ahead and shredded those just a little bit too. And so those went in. And, oh, I forgot the carrots, Phil. You want to get me a few carrots? Um, and then the, the peanut sauce is really easy, too. I, I like the fact that it's really easy. You use two tablespoons of, um, of just a plain peanut butter, one that's not, um, that doesn't have added sugar to it. And so two tablespoons of that. And the maple syrup, um, is one tablespoon each of maple syrup and lime juice. Thank you. So we have a tablespoon of that. And then we're going to add some cilantro. And it's, it's like a tablespoon of cilantro. And I forgot my handy dandy little garlic press, so. So you're just going to put the cilantro in here, and I've got garlic to mince up. And as I say, I usually use my garlic press, so that's pretty easy. And then I'm going to add some of this to each one. So you've got your whole rainbow there. And then mix this all up. Oh, and I forgot. I used the crushed ginger. Um, one cube is a teaspoon. You can get this frozen at um, Trader Joe's in the frozen food section. And um, so that's really handy if you don't want to um, grate the ginger, your fresh ginger. So we mix that up really well. And then you add two more tablespoons of water. So it dilutes it a little bit and makes it more the consistency of the maple syrup. Isn't that a, a super simple um, peanut sauce? And it's so good. Now, for those of you that didn't eat the peanut sauce or are not crazy about peanuts or allergic to peanuts, what I used was, in place of the peanuts, the peanut butter, I used two tablespoons of Bragaminos. I used one tablespoon of the um, tahini and I cut the maple syrup by one tablespoon. So it's still, both the sauces are super, super easy. Doesn't take long to make. And we'll just sprinkle it over. And voila, a good, healthy <laughs> meal has been prepared.
Now, Jay, did you get a meal today? Okay, so one's for you and one's for Eric. <laughs> okay, wow. Good stuff, huh? Did, uh, did all of you get a copy of the, of the um, recipe? Anybody miss one? Take, take this with okay, you. good. There's one, one person missed a copy of the recipe. Make sure we get that, okay? I think, raise your hand. Oh. Right over there, in the mid middle aisle, right there, Jan. In the middle of the aisle, he's raising his hand, right there. Okay. And if anybody else missed one, um, see me afterwards, okay? And, uh, and we'll make some more copies. There may even be some still sitting on the, uh, uh, in the uh, campus center that you'll want to, uh, you can go in there and check. If not, we'll certainly get more for you. Um, I want to tell you, we've got a number of things tonight, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> sadly, uh, tonight is the, is the season finale for our uh, See Me Fit program, and um, a lot went into it. Have you enjoyed uh, what we've done this far? Yeah. We've really tried to put together some really quality speakers and try to have some good, wholesome uh, food demonstrations for you. And, uh, you know, our, our logo, if you see our newly designed logo, it says, Engage, Eat, Exercise, Excel. And we've been talking about um, what we need to do to make healthy lifestyle changes. The first thing you have to do is you have to engage the mind. Many of you know that uh, as I struggled with obesity, um, about five years ago, it was the fall of 2014, I started working out with Kevin Chan. We would work out three days a week, and he was killing me. I weighed more than 280 pounds. And uh, he was killing me, man. I was coming, ah, oh, he's exhausted. But I was thinking, wow, you know, I just got to keep this thing up and, you know, I'll lose the weight. Um, I, I, I did not, I failed to understand that 80% of a lifestyle change has to do with what you eat, not with what you do. 20% with what you do. Um, and it wasn't until I, I engaged my brain and started rethinking some things and making some healthy choices in my mind that I was able to make the progress that I did. And so engage is the first step and the next step is to eat. And so through these demonstrations that Jan gives each evening, um, it's an opportunity uh, for you uh, to see how you can experience some um, wholesome uh, food preparation that is very, very tasty um, and very heart healthy as you'll hear in our uh, presentation from our lecturer tonight. And then the next one is exercise. Exercise is very important, but the problem is, is we try to put it at the beginning. Um, uh, several months ago, uh, I joined a new gym. I joined Fitness 19. And um, it's been interesting for me to go there because I, I understand the mindset of the people that are going there. I have seen just recently, within the last uh, few days, I, I've seen people coming in there, and I know that there are a few of you uh, that work out there, Carol, you do, uh, at Fitness 19. Uh, but my heart goes out to some people I've seen, uh, both men and women, well in excess of 300 pounds. They're coming in there, and man, they're just sweating like crazy. And exercise is important, but it is not the first thing you need to do. The first workout you need to have is in your kitchen. And when you work out in the kitchen and you work it out right, you're ready to go do a workout in the gym. And I've invited my friends from Fitness 19. Teddy, uh, come on up here. And uh, Teddy is the manager of Fitness 19, and he, he brought some of his uh, trainers with him. And uh, uh, I invited uh, Teddy to come tonight and talk to us uh, just for a couple of quick minutes um, about uh, what they can do for you. If you're looking for a great place to work out, Fitness 19 is a, is a great opportunity. And um, so, uh, Teddy, um, what can you do to help people make those healthy lifestyle uh, changes? So I know, you got, I know you guys have the 80-20 rule here, right? And that's a very good rule to go to buy. 80% nutrition and diet, 20% is what you do, right? And so one of the things, first I want to know, do you guys... Have, raise your hands if you've heard of Fitness 19. Okay, a couple of you guys, a lot of you guys haven't. Um, we're very, I just want to tell you a little bit about our gym, okay? We're a very family-oriented gym. We're not far, like four minutes away on LA Avenue and First Street. Um, so our gym, um, we opened up there in December. 
right? And so what we specialize in at our gym is helping people, right? We're not just a gym that's going to throw you a membership and say, good luck, okay? Because we get there's a lot of people that haven't gotten the right studying or they haven't, done the, haven't learned enough to know what to do in the gym. And I know can, that can be intimidating, right? Um, people walk in and they immediately they see the treadmill, go straight to the treadmill, right? But there's so many other advantages that a gym has to offer, and that's why it's so important to go to a gym. Um, my anatomy professor used to always say, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? And he's talking about your bones, your joints, your tendons, your muscles. They're so important to build up and to keep strong so you can maintain a healthy lifestyle. Right, not just externally, but internally. Okay, and so what we do at this gym is not only give you a membership, all of our sales team, this is Ella and this is Hannah, all of our sales team, they help you guys, right? When you come in for membership, we give you a full tour, we explain how to use some of the machines, we explain what's important for you, and we help with personal training as well, which is a highly recommended thing that I'd recommend um, for anyone that wants to join the gym. Uh, personal training, um, even if you guys, what I want to extend to all of you guys is a one week free pass and one free personal training session to anyone that's interested in coming out. I have cards at the end, I'll pass to you guys. And anyone that wants to come, one week free pass, one free personal training session on the house. Yes. Oh, I thought she was, okay. Um, <laughs> so that's what I want, yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that a lot. Um, yes. 19, we're open 19 hours a day from 4 in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. So we're wide range, so whatever. Yes. We do not have a pool. We do have other amenities. Um, Ella here is going to kind of go over um, just very briefly when it comes to like getting the help for personal training. Because we don't just say, okay, we're going to work you out and make you sweat to death. We have a step and a process that we go through, and she's going to kind of touch bases on that for a little bit. Hi, guys. How you doing? Um, thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having us. Um, kind of like what Teddy was saying, we really specialize in changing lives at Fitness 19. You know, you don't just come in for a membership. We really invest ourselves into making sure that you're not just coming in to get a workout, but we're, we're changing your life. We're changing your lifestyle. We're making it for the better. We're making your life easier. We're getting your confidence level up. You're getting your energy levels up because it's not just about cosmetic reasons and what's on the outside. It's about what's on the inside too, you know, being healthy on the inside, living to however, you know, long as you can. Um, the quality of life that you're living as well, you know, being able to walk upstairs easily, being able to pick up a pencil, not hurting your back all those kinds of things. So we have, you know, an each an d individualized program for each and every one of you, which I think is really special as well. We kind of understand that not everyone's the same. You know, we create a program that's individualized to each and every person. Um, and so we go through kind of a five phases of fitness. So we have the first phase, which is corrective exercise, right? The most important thing and the first thing that we're gonna work on is your posture, your form, um, how you're gonna hold up the weight because weight training is really what's gonna get you to your goals and what's gonna get you that quality of life that you wanna be living. Um, cardio is great and cardio helps with a lot of things, but weight training is really what we specialize in and what we really push for, um, just because to build up that muscle, you, you need to lift the weights and you need to do it in a correct way so you're not hurting yourself. Big thing also with us is injury prevention, right? We don't want you to come in there, throw yourself on the weights and then hurt yourself and then never come back. You know, that's not, that's not fun. Um, so it's the first thing that we work on. Then we go into the second phase, which is going to be stability mobility. So stability mobility is going to be anything um, working on mostly your lower half, the lower region, for example, your knees, right? If you've got shaky knees or the instability in your knees and you don't have that foundation on your bottom half to be able to hold up the weight or to be able to hold up this half, right, it's going to collapse. Um, so it's the second thing that we're going to work on. We also uh, really 
touch base on how to teach you to like stretch correctly and foam roll. Um, it's really, really important to be able to loose up those muscles, get them warmed up, and also do the right um, steps after your workouts to make sure that you're not gonna be in pain and to get that recovery. Um, then the third phase that we go into is hypertrophy. So hyper hypertrophy is gonna be the actual scientific process of building muscle onto the body. So it's gonna be replacing all that fat, building the muscle on. And then we go into the fourth phase, toning, everybody's favorite phase, which is going to be that definition phase. That's where you're going to tighten everything up. Um, we're really going to start seeing that definition. You're really going to be able to sculpt and mold your body to how you kind of want it to. And then the fifth phase is going to be maintenance, right? So our ultimate goal is to kind of give you the tools, give you the knowledge, and then have you be able to kind of do this on your own and be able to have the knowledge and the tools to do your own workouts confidently and correctly um, and so maintenance is going to be kind of up to you right it's going to be having you guys come in on your own um, and making sure that you're keeping up with your nutrition plan because it is 80 20 80 percent nutrition 20 percent in the gym um, as well as you know getting in your workouts at a consistent manner weekly and for pretty much the rest of your life you know making it a lifestyle change so Last, we have Hannah here. She's just going to talk about very briefly the amenities that we offer um, and uh, how the membership works. Hey, guys. So um, we d we're not a normal gym. We have a couple of different memberships. We have basic, and we also have premium. So with our premium, we specialize. We have an in-body scanner. It's going to tell you muscle mass, body fat, percentage, all that great stuff. And then not only that, we have hydro massage chairs. So those are gonna help with like stress, relaxation, stuff like that. Um, we have another thing um, called red light therapy. And red light therapy is gonna help with collagen and elastin production. So um, that's really good for recovering from your workouts, um, muscle soreness, all that kinds of stuff. And um, <clears throat> we also have classes. We have a lot of great classes. We have cycling, we have um, Zumba. Lots of people love the Zumba classes. Um, but we have multiple locations and we have the lowest prices out of any of the gyms in Simi Valley. So um, we definitely work with you guys and what we'd like to do for you guys is also um, lower you guys' membership prices if you guys come in. We can discount you guys all $5 less than what we have. So you guys would only pay $10 a month for your membership but um, we'd really love to see you guys come in and I'll pass it back to you. I appreciate everything. Thank you guys for listening to us. We'll pass the cards out and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Teddy and team, yes. <clears throat> I really appreciate them coming because uh, you know we're focusing more on the 80% here, uh, but we did want you to know that that 20% is important. So. I uh, really encourage you, and I have enjoyed my uh, gym membership. Uh, Jan is a member there as well. Um, it's a good, clean gym, um, doesn't stink, and uh, you know that's that's something that's really, really important. So thank you so much, Teddy, uh, for coming this evening and and sharing that. We want to get on to our uh, main presentation tonight, and I'm thrilled to uh, introduce uh, my own personal cardiologist, uh, Dr. Arash Fard. Uh, he practices here in uh, Simi Valley. Um, and uh, uh, he shares his, uh, his home uh, with his wife, who is also a cardiologist. I believe, Doc, that she practices at Cedar, Cedars? She practices at Cedars. And so, um, anyway, uh, I invited him to come. Uh, some of you I've told that uh, uh, I actually blew the Doc away uh, when he saw the uh, health and lifestyle changes that I've made in my life, and um, I know he was very affirmative of that. And, I'm delighted that he can be here this evening and share with you um, how we can experience um, real radical heart health. So, Doc, please come. Let's welcome him. All right. You guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, thank you so much for, for having me, and thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, it did remind me that uh, I do, well, I knew this before, but I have to pick up my wife from the airport after this, and I realized that I, I've been married for about three months, and today is the second day that I've actually forgotten to wear my wedding ring, so of all those times. So I gotta stop home before I go and get her, but 
in case you guys ever run into her, if you're down at Cedars or whatever, just to please don't tell her I told you that, and we, we can go from there. Um, okay, so uh, I, I did want to, huh? Oh, man, you're, he's right, actually, he's right about that. We'll make sure wow. We'll send her, we'll send her the link. Um, okay. So what I, what I want to do tonight is just talk a little bit about diet and its impact on cardiovascular health specifically. Um, I have to, you're going to hear me say this several times during the, the brief presentation tonight, that I'm by no means a nutritional expert. And that, and that is, can be sometimes surprising to people when they're like, you're a cardiologist, how come you're not an expert in, in nutrition? And the sad truth is, honestly, in, in physician training, especially these days, it's not overly emphasized, I think, the way that it either once was or it probably should be. And we, we get hung up a lot on treatment of disease, and we don't really uh, focus that much on prevention. And, and, and a lot of the stuff we talk about tonight is something that can seriously prevent most of the stuff that I get called in to treat. And um, that's, and I just think it's, it's, it's the base, the foundation of, of what we need to kind of focus on going forward. So, um, and then I'll leave some time for some questions at the end if, if anybody has anything that uh, um, comes up during the presentation. Um, I will say, I'm sorry, there's gonna be a few slides that I didn't realize the size of the projector and everything, so we're not gonna be able to read a few things, so I'll try to either read them or kind of summarize them, basically. So what I wanted to uh, start with here is basically, this is uh, um, just a few pictures. Uh, I tried not to, I wasn't sure if we'd be eating at the time, so I didn't wanna use any actual photos of, of this type of thing, just in case. Um, but this is the typical, these are the typical things that you often think about when you think of cardiology or heart health. And on the left is basically a, a schematic of what an open heart bypass surgery would look like when you're having bypass done. And on the other side is, is just a, a picture of a cardiac cath lab and then just a basic diagram of what we do in a catheterization when someone's either having a heart attack or we worry that they're on their way to having one. That's the type of procedure we do when we go up into the heart and actually try to open blood vessels. So the reason I show this in the beginning and, and, and what uh, um, Phil so nicely mentioned in the beginning, we were talking about radical heart health, and this is something that really stuck to me when I was training, um, where we had a, uh, one of our cardiologists was sort of um, a little bit of the outcast as far as the cardiologist, and I trained in New York City, and as far as in, in the group, um, uh, his style was a little bit different, and that's because he pushed, he was very much a plant-based doctor, and that's what he talked about all the time, and that's what he pushed. Um, and, you know, because it's not really the common thing we're used to thinking about or hearing, especially in, in heart health, he was kind of the weird guy or the radical guy with the whole thing. And the way he put it to me one day is he basically was talking about stuff like this, and he said, you know, which one is more radical to you, changing your diet or, or having your chest cracked open? It's, it really kind of seems like one is a little more radical than the other, and, and I, we get a little mixed up, I think, often in what's normal and what isn't. Um, Okay, so I wanted to start really quick by just going over, this is the, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology, that's what those letters are there. They basically put out a, a, a summary for, this is geared towards me, so this is not geared towards, towards the general public, but what should we as physicians be focusing on as far as prevention of cardiac disease? And the reason I bring this up is I just wanna show you how many of these 10 things they list are kind of diet-related things, which is, which is uh, pretty common. This is just a, a, a slide based on evidence, which we don't really need to focus on. The, uh, so the 10 kind of take home messages they started with, which uh, the first one being, uh, which is hard to read, so I can, I can read it for you guys, is the most important way to prevent atherosclerotic vascular disease, which is heart attacks and, and that sort of thing, heart failure, and then arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, is to promote a healthy lifestyle throughout life. That's number one. That's the first thing that they tell us to tell people, not to put them on a medication or to do anything like that. but this is, this is really the focus. Um, second, there's a, uh, um, basically, is it <laughs> I included this one for good reason, I'll let you know in a second. So it's a team-based care approach is an effective strategy for the to, uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, I bring that up again to, to specify that I'm by no means an expert in what I'm about to go into right now. So that basically, it's, it's an entire treatment team that's required for this kind of thing but between cardiologists and, and family practitioners and dietitians and physical therapists, and, and basically we all sort of work together, and that's something that more and more is becoming a focus as opposed to, you know, 40 years ago, it would be basically my word or, or the highway, basically. And, it, and, it, and now very much it's, when, if you come into my office, it's a, it's a, it's a team-based thing. I'll, I'll pr I present uh, but basically your options, what I think is the best case to do, but it's really a, a team decision. And, and this is really kind of what that's getting into there. Um, third, so basically, uh, 
this is something that's, that's a little more recent in the rankings. They're basically people who are between 40 and 75 years need to, need to see their primary doctor or cardiologist or something to kind of risk stratify yourself as far as, uh, as heart disease goes. Now, we have a risk calculator that the American Heart Association is asking us to use, and it factors in things like your blood pressure, your, uh, your, uh, um, your cholesterol, whether you're a diabetic, whether you're being treated for cholesterol or blood pressure, and your age and gender, and basically they give you a 10-year risk score. And that basically says, what is your risk of having a heart event in the next 10 years? And based on that, we sort of dis decide how aggressive do we have to be in, in, in uh, modifying risk factors uh, as we go. Um, okay, and number four, back to diet. So, so all adults should consume a healthy diet that emphasizes the intake of vegetables, fruits, nuts, whole grains, lean vegetable or animal protein, and fish, and minimizes the intake of trans fats, red meat, and processed red meats, refined carbs, and sweetened beverages. So basically right there, it's, it, it, the first two out of the first four are already, it's in, uh, basically showing us how important they think diet is in preventing disease. Okay, exercise we haven't forgotten about. So basically they recommend that engaging at least at 150 minutes per week of accumulated moderate intensity physical activity or 75 if it's, if it's more vigorous. So, so absolutely, this is, that's very important. Um, and then we get into lifestyle changes for certain diseases. So diabetics, number one, improving dietary habits and lifestyle changes is absolutely the first course of action. It's not medication, although there are first line medications and, and that sort of thing, but, but we get much better control with lifestyle changes with sugar than, than we do with, with medicines. Um, smoking, I don't really need to get much into. I wouldn't, it, it's not exactly controversial to say that smoking is bad for your health, so I'll, I'll go ahead and leave that at that. But, if you do smoke, I highly recommend you quit, and that's that. But I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. Um, okay, uh, aspirin is a newer thing. I wouldn't pay much as much attention to this, but we are kind of. Uh, there's a lot of people out there on aspirin. We're kind of shying away from aspirin um, these days, unless you've had a heart disease in the past or that kind of thing. Then it's then absolutely aspirin. But these days, we're kind of scaling that back as they found that aspirin in, in people with no heart with low heart risk. Basically, it sometimes does more harm than good in, in bruising and bleeding, and anyone who's been on it knows that you can have that sort of reaction, but that's just sort of an aside here. Um, and then we get into drug therapy for cholesterol. So, so statins, basically, which are the mainstay for cholesterol treatment, uh, these are the kind of groups that we kind of look at, but the people we target are very high-risk individuals for these. But this is not a substitute for diet, as we're going to get into. Um, and very much uh, so, I usually give people a chance, unless their cholesterol is sky high, I usually emphasize giving them a chance for diet and exercise and rechecking before we, we, we commit to any sort of medication. And finally, another, another uh, thing with diet and, and, and exercise is blood pressure. Um, Non-pharmacological -pharma interventions are recommended for elevated blood pressure, um, and that's the first line, absolutely. Anytime you, I start seeing elevated blood pressure readings in my clinic, besides just telling the person to check it at home, we, we go over diet and exercise apps, because that's something that can, can curb this before it becomes a, a serious problem. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me with, with, with the little scientific approach now. I just want to talk about why diet's important, and I'm just going to talk about a few different diets that are recommended by the American Heart Association. Um, there are tons of diets out there. Um, I don't know much about a lot of them, but I know, I know a good amount about the ones that the, that the American Heart Association recommends as far as uh, uh, healthy diets go. So the standard American diet, which is abbreviated SAD, unfortunately. So. It's, you can argue that it's the number one risk factor for leading causes of death and disability, and mostly because it is such a risk factor for, for risk factors of heart disease. So risk factors for getting things like heart attacks are things like diabetes and high blood pressure, and diet is a, one of the number one risk factors for developing those, those type of conditions that can lead to, to um, uh, a heart problems. So basically 50% of adults today have a chronic illness of some kind, and that, that, the chronic illnesses basically are almost 90% of our entire health care costs. It's, it's, it's just, things like diabetes that people have to live with for a long time and, and, and day by day. But a lot of them are largely preventable. Um, so, and then 65% basically of adults are either overweight or obese, and that's a risk factor for some, of the, from some conditions. And it's, uh, child obesity is also a problem that, that's been increasing. Um, and di diabetes and hypertension, as we mentioned before, also has been showing up younger and younger, unfortunately. Okay, so um, this is a nice little, basically, this is from a cardiology textbook. The Braunwald Heart Disease is sort of our, our mainstay textbook that we, we, we grow up with uh, in cardiology. And 
This is just an example of a couple different things, and this is specifically with blood pressure. And they've done research with these things, and basically the, the column on the left is stuff that, that we want to try to uh, limit, and the, on the right is basically the amount of points in your blood pressure reading that you might see a difference if you're able to commit to sorts of things like that. So weight reduction is probably the number one thing as far as that goes, and, and, and dropping the BMI to a normal kind of level can, depending on how many kilos you lose, they, they say anywhere from 20 to 50 points per 10 kilos. That's, I mean, that's a lot of weight, but it shows you the, basically that the, um, the, the power that that can have. Uh, the second one is the DASH diet. It's a diet I'm going to talk about a little bit now. It's been used in, 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 uh, in medicine for, for quite a few years now and uh, basically emphasizes fruits, vegetables, and low-fat dairy, things like that, and that drops, that can drop anywhere around 10 points, just, just changing your diet, basically. You can go from a systolic the blood pressure of 140 to 130-ish just by changing the diet there without any medication. Um, salt restriction on the left, that, that's a big one also, anywhere from two to eight uh, millimeters of mercury or points on, on, on the blood pressure. Physical activity, avoiding tobacco, and cutting back on alcohol are all things that basically really help as far as managing blood pressure. So these are the type of things that I talk to, to my patients about um, and you know, when we're thinking about starting a blood pressure medicine, and I usually send them out for a few weeks to months and have them come back with some readings for me, but to try to work on stuff like this and the amount of times where, where they come back and I don't have to start anything is, is, is actually a really, really nice thing to, to have to happen. And, and, and to avoid medications whenever you can is, is nice for sure. So this is oh okay. So this one's going to be a little more difficult to read. I apologize. It's it's a uh, um, basically a, a, a thing from the American Heart Association where um, everything on the left is basically uh, uh, foods and food groups that are taken um, where the the intake is below the recommended limit for the average uh, average American. And on the right are things that we we take too much of. And it's basically everything you can imagine. So. Vegetables is the very first one where, where the vast majority of the population is not eating enough vegetables. Uh, second is fruit. Total grains is third. Dairy is fourth. Uh, protein is, is, is their fifth. Oils is, is sixth. And then the ones on the bottom that you notice are completely shifted to the, what we would consider to be the, the, the less preferable or the wrong side are things like added sugars, saturated fats, and salt. And those are things that we have no problem getting enough of, but the, but the other things are, are, are what we have our deficiencies in. Um, just a few things on uh, where we get our salt as far as uh, that goes. And this is, this is important because if any time I tell somebody to watch their salt intake, the first thing we think of is, okay, I'm just not going to add salt to my food, which is, which is a great start. Believe me, that, that is a great start. Getting the salt shaker off the table is very, very important. But unfortunately, these days, any, any food you get, especially if you eat out or, or you get anything out, it's, it's loaded with salt because that's where the flavor often is. So if they want to make it taste good, often, oftentimes the, 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 the move is to put salt in it. And uh, so that's something that, that basically, uh, I don't, we don't need to get into all the little parts of this pie, but the big thing, the 44% is basically mixed dishes. And that's, the, that's basically stuff that you wouldn't really think as much as having a lot of salt in it. But, it, but it's, it's, it's fully, it's prepared meals and, and, and things like that where uh, um, it breaks it down on the side and basically there's pizza and burgers and things like that which have all the salt in it even without you having to add anything to it. Um, same type of thing with sugar. Um, the vast majority, I mean, you get the, the purple side on the side with the 31%, that's the snacks and sweets. That's basically where you're going to think a lot of the sugar comes from. Uh, really beverages that are not um, mostly sodas and that kind of thing is the biggest group here. And that's the gray one on the side, which is about 50% of where an uh, average American will get their, their sugars from would be sweetened beverages. And, that, and that's the big one there. Okay, so just, you know, we're going to get into just a few of the diets. I'm just going to kind of cover three very briefly. Uh, if you guys have any questions about them at the end, uh, by all means, let me know, and I'll answer them as best I can. Um, but okay, so the, the first one, I basically kind of combine these because they're pretty similar. Um, so there's the American Heart Association Heart Healthy Diet, and then there's the DASH Diet. They they're both have been used for a number of years in, in medicine, and they have a lot of similarities, so I, I've kind of put them together. Um, so basically, I, they're, they're listed here, and I can, I can read them to you. So the top one is the American Heart Association plan, and it, it emphasizes, as we mentioned before, eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, and fat-free or low-fat dairy products. And, uh, and it involves counting how much salt you eat and counting saturated fats specifically. Animal fats, things like that, is really they want you to keep track of that sort of thing with the diet. 
And just an example of, of stuff with a, an average dinner or something you can have under that diet would be something like roasted turkey with summer squash, a whole wheat roll, and a cranberry salad. That's, that's the example that, they, that the American Heart Association gives as far as, as their diet goes. So the, and then the DASH diet, which just stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So it was specifically designed to combat high blood pressure. That's, that's the, was the whole point of, of the diet when it, when, it, when it was developed. So what they emphasize is eating foods that can lower blood pressure, including things that are high in potassium and magnesium-rich uh, fruits. And that's a lot of times because when we use potassium salts, we're able to avoid using a lot of sodium salts. And the sodium salts are really what kind of drives up the blood pressure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that emphasizes fruits and vegetables like bananas and beans, and then calcium-rich foods like low-fat and non-fat dairy foods. Um, they also emphasize eating foods low in saturated fat and total fat, and then they recommend, but they do recommend healthy fats, like what they consider unsaturated fats, things like low, uh, um, uh, nuts and olive oil, and which we're going to see heavily emphasized in the Mediterranean diet when I speak about that in a few minutes. Um, but that is something that's emphasized in the DASH diet. And uh, it really, it gives you a specific amount of foods from different food groups. It's very structured, the DASH diet is, um, in the way that it's, that it's done. And an example of that uh, would be a grilled chicken with a steamed broccoli, uh, a spinach salad with cherry tomatoes and a low calorie dressing, and then a low fat yogurt with strawberries for dessert. So that's the example they give for, for that one. Again, these aren't my examples. My, I, mine would be all over the place. So hopefully these, these are the kind of the ones that they give there. Um, and then the, the, the U.S. government also has the USDA has their own kind of diet, which is a little bit similar to the other ones, and, and they basically focus on fruits and vegetables, whole grains and lean proteins, very similar to the other diets. Um, Low-fat or non-fat dairy, which also they mention, or, or fortified soy beverages. So this is the first one that kind of mentions soy a little bit. And uh, counting how much salt you eat, also very specific um, to, to trying to keep track of that in the saturated fat, as well as they emphasize making sure you know how much sugar you're putting in your body. And uh, for this one, they recommend a chicken taco on a whole grain tortilla with tomatoes, lettuce, and low-fat cheese uh, with the side of brown rice and black beans with carrot sticks and fresh fruit for, for dessert. So these are a few just different examples of, 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 the, uh, of these diets. So I just want to get into the DASH diet a little bit more as far as uh, what it entails because it is kind of similar to the other ones. So um, it, is, it was developed, like I mentioned, as a non-drug uh, way of treating hypertension of high blood pressure without having to start people on medications. So it emphasizes whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, it also emphasizes getting adequate calcium, potassium, and magnesium as far as uh, your electrolytes go. And then the, it is low in red meat, sweets, and sugar beverages, as you can imagine. And uh, also in saturated, which are more animal, and trans fats, which are the artificial fats you see a lot in, in things like uh, commercial baked goods and chips and, and, and that kind of thing is where you get a lot of your trans fats from. So they want you to watch out for, for those types of fats. Um, so it, it, it kind of tested the whole pattern, basically, when they studied this thing. They had people do everything, not just individual parts of it, and then they saw what happens if somebody adheres to the, the whole diet. Um, and then they used common foods with this one that would be easy for the public to kind of use. And uh, they wanted it, it to be um, a good diet that can be followed, you know, d despite what specialty you're looking at. So, for example, I mean, there's, there's diets out there like a, a keto or a paleo, which, which you could see some people doing, but, but, but like a cardiologist would frown on that sort of, uh, that sort of high fat diet in, in a way. So they, they wanted to make sure that their diet did not conflict with any other uh, specialties because sometimes we get into uh, to things in between different medical specialties uh, as far as something might be beneficial for one body system, but it might, be a, it might pose a risk to another body system. So they wanted everything to kind of be compatible. And uh, so this is kind of the breakdown of the servings um, based on a 2,000 calorie daily diet here. So the, the first one is grains, which is about six to eight servings. Uh, vegetables, about four to five. Fruits, also four to five. Low fat or fat-free dairy, about two to three. Um, uh, meats, poultry, and fish, you want combined kind of less than six. Uh, the nuts, seeds, dry beans, and peas, they want four to five at least a week. Fats and oils down to two and three. And then really the sweets and the sodium are really limited in this type of diet. So the uh, the sweets basically only five servings a week is what they want with this type of thing, and then the salt they really want b b below about 2,300 milligrams, which is which is tough to do th these days, but it, but it's achievable. Um, but that that's kind of the basis of the diet there, and then they but they do um, 
mentioned that, that this is kind of a, uh, a gradual thing, especially, and I want to emphasize if anyone's considering a change in diet or, or anything like that, is it's really much easier to kind of gradually go towards what you want to do rather than um, if you're used to putting a ton of salt on things and the next day you take all the salt away, you're going to hate your food. And it, it's something that you want to gradually do, gradually build up the fruit and vegetables, uh, gradually kind of get rid of those, those bad fats, and it, you'll find it much more easier to stick with something when, it, when it's, it's sort of a slowly developing thing that, that you're kind of committed to. Um, and then basically we switched by fat. So they emphasize more whole grains and cereals. Um, and then the, the meat that they really try to limit the, the servings a little bit as far as that goes, but really not as much as some of the ones you're gonna see a little bit uh, later on here. Okay, and then salt, of course, this is gonna be the mainstay of the DASH diet. Basically, if you wanna lower your blood pressure, you gotta lower your salt intake, and that, that's the number one thing. And yeah, so, so the third point really is, is, is what I was talking about just a second ago, is reduce it slowly over a couple of weeks, and that way your taste buds will uh, accumulate to it a little bit better than if you suddenly change everything, and it'll be a lot more difficult to stick with if it's not something you're, uh, if, it's, if it's much different than what you usually eat. Okay, so just a few ways to watch out for salt. I mean, obviously looking at the labels is, is a thing. There, there is, you know, if you stick to a diet like this, there's gonna be some math involved. You're gonna have to kind of figure out exactly how many milligrams of, of, of sodium you're putting into yourself. So number one, as I, I mentioned off the top, is get the salt shaker off the table. It's something that you should try to do as best you can. Um, and adding little, if any, salt to your cooking. Um, trying to add vegetables or things, or trying to, to buy vegetables that don't have salt and these kind of things already added to them, which is sometimes hard to find. Um, uh, soups and stews are a big thing that we often see because canned soups often have so much salt in them. They might be one of the saltiest things we see out there. And, and so just be very conscious of, of things like that. If that's something you eat a lot, um, just, just be conscious of how much uh, of salt is, is in there when, you, when you're eating it. Um, uh, herbs and spices is something they recommend, and that's for a flavoring type of thing especially. To try to get rid of salt, you want to flavor your food somehow. You don't want to be eating bland food, and, and that way, I mean, I, I, I don't want to stand up here and telling people not to enjoy their food or their lives. That's the last thing I want. But, but it really has to be kind of a gradual thing, so it's something you actually enjoy eating, and you get accustomed to eating, and, and, it, it, it's, and you'll never look back at that point, honestly. Um, okay, a couple more things to con sodium. Canned, yeah, canned goods definitely have uh, a lot of salt in them. Uh, from the diagram, I mean, I don't have to tell you pizza, and, and, and very often you can have dressings. Uh, dressings are a thing often to watch out for, especially because everything else could be healthy that you're eating there, but if you dump a ton of salty or oily dressing on there, it could basically counteract what you're trying to do. Okay, so moving forward, the Mediterranean diet has is, is been around forever, really. The, the, the issue is it, it hasn't been, it's been uh, much more aggressively studied in the last 20, 25 years or so. There was one big study that was published in 2013 called the Predimed study, and then they kind of redid that study a few years ago and, and took out some of the things that they thought might have made, made a little bit of bias in the study. Um, but I'm gonna just touch on that very quickly because it was such a kind of a, uh, a dramatic thing when we kind of saw the results of, of, of the study. So. Uh, We'll move forward. So the Mediterranean diet, the one thing about it is, is there's no set Mediterranean diet, un unfortunately, because it's basically based on the cuisine of a region. And, and there are regional kind of variations with that. So unlike the DASH diet, which is very regimented, a Mediterranean diet is kind of more of an idea than a strict kind of uh, a regimented um, uh, process. Okay, so what is it? So I'm sorry, there's a lot of words here again. So basically that's what I just told you. There's at least 16 countries border the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so diets vary between these, two, these countries. There's no set kind of region, but basically what they emphasize is the same type of thing. And that's a high consumption of fruit, vegetables, breads, and other cereals. So, so far it sounds very familiar to, to the other diets we talked about. Um, the second one, it, it, it differs right away. So olive oil is a mainstay for, for, for that region, obviously, as, as, as many of us can imagine. Um, and it is a very, it's heavily emphasized in, in the diet and in the study also when, when they did it. So they use that as an important monounsaturated fat source. Uh, the dairy products, fish and poultry, are consumed in a low to moderate amount and very little red meat is eaten in this diet. So basically this is a, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you, I believe, a food pyramid in a second, what it looks like compared to your conventional food pyramid. But you could already see that meats are basically being de-emphasized as, as we're going in these diets. And when they are emphasized, they're things more like fatty fish, like a salmon or a tuna or a mackerel, those kind of things that have good fats associated with them um, uh, is what they emphasize more so than, than, than red meats. 
Um, eggs are a little more limited here also. They say zero to four times a week to, ha to have eggs, and uh, it wouldn't be the Mediterranean without mentioning wine in, in some sort of capacity. So wine is, was uh, drank with, with low to moderate amounts in this. It wasn't heavily regulated in the study, but they did allow people to, to drink a moderate or, or low amount of, of, of wine uh, with the study. So, um, okay, so how does it differ from the traditional food pyramid? So on the left is the USDA traditional pyramid we think of. The bottom has the, the, the bases, the breads, the cereals with six to 11 servings a day. Um, they have the fruits and vegetables, which are the next, which are two to four servings and three to five servings a day, respectively. And then as we go up, you get two to three servings of milk and yogurt and cheese, but also of, of meat, fish, poultry, eggs, nuts, those type of things a day. And then, uh, and then sparingly is things like sweets, fats, and oils. And that's the, this is the typical food pyramid that we've had for a number of years. The one on the right here, now this is the Mediterranean pyramid, and you'll notice that there's not set servings, again, because I mentioned it's, it's not a very set diet and not as regimented, but you do have the breads at the bottom, things like, and they mentioned things like couscous and polenta and things like that get put in there, fruits and vegetables, but then they put in a, a nice little strip there in the middle for basically things like uh, legumes, so beans and peas and that kind of thing, and those, those are much more heavily emphasized in the Mediterranean diet and in, and in vegan diets than they are in, in the other ones. Um, and then as you go up, there is an entire platform for itself for olive oil there. That green strip there by itself in the middle, just, just olive oil. And then above that, cheese and yogurt, fish, poultry as we go up, and that really teeny tiny tip at the top is red meat in this diet. So it's a very small, and it's something that's, that's eaten maybe once or twice a week in, in this diet as opposed to, to, to the other diet, which basically says it's okay if you eat it daily as long as it's lean. Um, okay, so this is a lot of words here, but basically what, what they're trying to, what the American, I got this slide from the American Heart Association, and, and what they're trying to do is basically give people information about the Mediterranean diet, but kind of focus on that, you know, there is some, there's a little bit of stuff that's out, out for debate as far as it's not a slam dunk, that it's the greatest thing that I'm about to show you that it looks like it is. But, so they do mention that, uh, you know, people who have, who do follow this diet, as opposed to the average American diet, basically do eat less saturated fat, um, and then that's, that works well within our regular guidelines, but they do get about half the fat uh, they get is from calories, or sorry, for half the calories they get is from fat, which is different than, than we're used to, but that fat is mostly from things like olive oil and, uh, and, and uh, unsaturated uh, oils like that. Um, they, so, but they do mention that the incidence of heart disease, so that actually the rates of heart disease in those regions is much lower than we have here. Um, there is some concern that, that with the uh, uh, that with some of these um, some of these high fat diets it might lead to some obesity so that's where the, the jury's a little bit out but overall they have far lower rates of heart disease than we do and that that's uh, kind of what what prompted them to kind of look at this a little bit further so the one medical paper I'm going to talk about very briefly um, I won't get into too much as far as the uh, the, the nitty gritty of this but this was the PREDIMED study that I was mentioning before. It was published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is arguably the best med medical journal in the world. Um, that and the Lancet in, in, in the UK, probably. But uh, they basically were looking at comparing the, uh, a Mediterranean diet, and they basically had two different types. One that was very heavy in, in extra virgin olive oil, which you'll see is listed as EVOO later on. And uh, another one that's more emphasized with seeds and nuts and that, and that sort of thing as far as a way to get your fats. Um, versus, and, and this is, and this is the, the emphasis that I want to make and what makes this, this study so interesting is they didn't compare these to your average American diet or your average you know, diet that any random person would be eating. They actually compared this to the first diet I talked to you about, to the actual American Heart Association diet, which I'll tell you the vast majority of Americans are not eating. Um, but it's better than what most people are eating, so it, it was very stark comparison that that's actually what they were comparing to. Um, this is just basically, I do not expect anybody to read this, um, but basically this is what I just summarized to you, that, that they had these kind of three groups, and, and I'll just read the conclusion to you briefly, but basically in a study involving, uh, uh, what I do want to say is it was a large study. This involved almost 7,500 patients, so it was, it was a really big kind of study there. And uh, basically, in, in, person, in people with high cardiovascular risk, the incidence of major cardiovascular events was lower among those assigned to a Mediterranean diet supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or nuts than those assigned to a reduced fat diet. So it looked better than, than, the, than the other. Uh, um, and, and I'll show you just the chart really quick, which, which we will be able to see. 
that uh, it did look like a, uh, um, that, that people did better with it. Uh, this just basically is a quick summary of, of the differences between the diet groups, and it basically is very much what we mentioned before. Um, we can't really see it, but I'll, I'll tell you that the very first one on the list is olive oil, and they emphasized over four teaspoons a day of that. Um, and uh, sorry, tablespoons a day. And that was one of the things, there was a few foods in the study that they actually gave people for free because they wanted to make sure that people were eating it. So they were giving people olive oil and nuts and to make sure that they took as much as they recommended. Um, and then they discouraged things like soda and red meats and, and fats, but they discouraged that in both. Um, so yeah, the main difference is basically the amount of kind of red meat and, uh, the, the, and then the, the Mediterranean diet with the emphasis on the, the good fats and the, and the fish and uh, um, things like that and the, the beans and, and peas and stuff like that, with, which is what they emphasize more. Um, this basically just points out that I, I put this in because it's a good thing anytime you're mentioning a study, it just basically compares the different patient groups and you'll just unfortunately with the house small, you'll have to take my word for it that the patient groups across the three different diets they tried were pretty similar. So it's not like one group was a much higher risk than another group. They actually did a good job of, of keeping those groups pretty similar. And okay, so the results, this one we can at least see from, from, every, from anywhere. So, the left is basically what they were looking at for their primary endpoint, and that involves basically heart attacks, strokes, or death from a heart-related cause. And the, 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 um, the black line at the top is, is the control diet. That's the regular American Heart Association low-fat low diet. The two colored lines below it are the two Mediterranean diets. As you can see, they, they separated pretty quickly on the curve. So, and the bottom is basically time. They, they follow these people for about five years. And over the five years, basically within six months, you could start to see a difference between the two groups as far as what was going on. And, and at, uh, by five years, it kept going uh, farther apart to the point that they actually had to stop this study for ethical reasons. And, and basically the reason behind that is when you're doing a medical study and if you find that one group is doing so much better than the other group, it's not ethical to continue the study at that point in time because you know you might be doing the other people a disservice. So that's, that's why they actually had to stop at this point because the, the results were getting so kind of dramatic. Um, the, the one point that we do need to make on the right is this is just total mortality, which is just deaths from any cause, and that really didn't differ between the groups. And, and that's often what you see with a lot of medical studies because the, 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 the reasons that people may pass away are so, uh, uh, there's such a wide variety of it that, that oftentimes you see that. So that, that's not usually an alarm if we don't see total mortality changing, but the, the number of heart attacks and strokes and, and uh, death from, from heart causes was, was very dramatic between the two. Okay, so that's a little about the Mediterranean diet. Now I'm gonna talk about just a plant-based diet for a little bit. I, I, I don't mean for you to eat that, but that's the first picture of a plant I found and I, I thought it, <laughs> I thought it uh, worked pretty well <laughs> from the side, so anyway. And now it doesn't wanna leave, okay. So just to basic aside, so this is basically just the US uh, food consumption as a percent of calories and just basically how much of our, where are we getting our calories from right now? And that big one right there with the 63% is processed foods, and that's things that has added fats and oils, sugars, and refined grains, and that's where a lot of our diabetes and things like that are coming from. Um, the, the plant food, unfortunately, is, is a much smaller percentage. That's the green one, and your animal is, is the red there. So we're trying to basically reverse this as much as we can. Okay, so this, this is basically that same slide I mentioned before about the SAD diet. And here is a example of, uh, from Loma Linda, this is an example of a, uh, a, a vegan or a vegetarian uh, health pyramid, basically. And so down at the bottom, you got your whole grains, but also down there, you have your, your beans and your peas and your soy. Um, fruits and vegetables are in the same exact spot that they are in other ones, but they're overemphasized. There's more servings of fruit, fruit and vegetables. This is six to nine here, where the other ones were three to five or in that range. Uh, as you move up, you get nuts and seeds and then vegetable oils, as we kind of mentioned with the Mediterranean diet, and then dairy, eggs, and sweets again is the very top. And in this one, there's no tip for the red meat or anything like that because this is the vegetarian one. But So you got sweets up top there um, as far as the, what we want to limit as, uh, the most here. So just a few kind of, and I'll just, I'm just going to throw a couple quick summaries from some random, from some studies and some uh, medical groups and their opinions on basically a, a plant-based diet. but but. This is one of those things that, that you're not gonna get a lot of debate from many people about. I, I mean, we, back of our heads, we know that a lot of the things that we eat are probably not very good for us, and a lot of, especially the, the saturated fats, and a lot of the animal stuff that we eat is probably not good for us, and we're getting a lot and a lot more examples of that being the case, but 
just in general, I mean, these are some of the things that, that you, you typically see when you, when you change your diet to kind of a plant-based thing is, is blood pressure, blood sugar, right away. That's your, blood that's your high blood pressure and your diabetes. Those are your two your, your cardiac risk factors right there. Um, lower cholesterol is another one, the lower body weight. Uh, inflammation is something that's interesting because that, that's one of the, uh, the, the basically processes that, that, that can damage blood vessels. And a lot of times, and this is a little bit poorly understood, but it's, it's sort of thought of that a lot of the, uh, uh, sometimes in the result of some of our normal gut bacteria that we have, the way they break down animal products, especially red meats and that kind of thing, is they create uh, certain substances that, that get absorbed by your body and actually cause blood vessel damage or cause uh, uh, inflammation and swelling of those blood vessels. And the, the problem with that is that's the first step to, to, to heart disease, is basically getting inflammation in those vessels, and that allows cholesterol and all those things to get underneath the blood vessel wall, and that's what forms those plaques that we, we worry about when we talk about heart attacks. Um, and then immune function, function most likely will, will improve, uh, longevity gets better, and then there's a lot of, basically pre prevention, absolutely. Prevention of diseases, absolutely, with, with this sort of diet. Treatment to a lot of ways. A lot of, a lot of times that we can treat these things, especially early on with these dietary interventions and not have to worry about it. And there are a few conditions out there that actually could be technically reversed. If you, if you get a diabetic sugar and you, and you change your diet and you go back a few months later, you see your doctor, they check the sugar again, it's back in a normal range. You typically you sort of reversed your diabetes as, as, it, was, as it was happening. And that, that's something that, that we can see but with, with, with dietary changes. Um, okay, so these are just a few of the, of the, uh, of the different studies that basically about the, the vegetarian diets. I'm just gonna summarize very quickly. So the, at Oxford, they did a, the, what was called the EPIC study, had about uh, almost a half million people in this study, and they basically said that it was a large prospective study. They found lower mortality, so lower death rates observed with a long, large consumption of fruits and vegetables. Again, not surprising, but just things that, you know, it, it's out there and the, the proof is really coming out as far as that goes. There, uh, uh, basically, systematic review of a bunch of bunch of different randomized trials that they that they found that plant-based diets experience lower blood pr uh, lower cholesterol comp uh, concentrations uh, as opposed to those that eat a lot of animal products. Um, the vegetarian diets confer protection against cardiovascular diseases uh, and risk factors, some cancers, and overall death. Um, I mean, these are the basically they're all basically saying the same type of thing, but. Um, it's just amazing a lot of times how many times these things have to come out and especially as physicians kind of hit us in the face before we start kind of doing something about it. Okay, so as far as a plant-based diet, what, what kind of things are we emphasizing? Uh, on the left, I mean, it, it goes without saying, but vegetables, obviously. We're, we're looking at leafy vegetables, roots, starchy, mushrooms. Uh, the variety is really the key. Um, as, as, as we were mentioning before, to, uh, eating the rainbow, as, as you mentioned, is absolutely so important because that, that's where you, that's, it, it's kind of an easy way to make sure you're getting all the vitamins and nutrients you do. If you're eating foods, fruits and vegetables, a bunch of different colors, you can be pretty sure that you're getting everything you need out, out, out of those. Um, fruits, leg uh, legumes, which we mentioned, beans and peas, that kind of thing, whole grains, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and what we're trying to avoid and eliminate are things, uh, basically animal foods, refined sugar, refined flours, oils and margarines, those are the type of things, the, the, the trans fats that I was talking about, the processed fats are what you want to try to avoid. Um, the way I want to emphasize it with the animal foods and the way that same uh, cardiologist I was talking to you about before with the radical heart health that he mentioned to me before was, uh, I heard him tell a, t a patient one time who was there having, a, she was having, she had a heart attack and, and, and she thought she ate very well, and, and many people do, but, but, but he was going over and, and he, he, he did this almost to a fault. He would start listing foods and basically just start listing any animal product you can think of and start saying that it's bad. And uh, he, he got to turkey and she said, but I thought turkey was good and he, and he, just, and he just stopped. And, uh, and he just shook his head. He's like, he's like turkey is not good. He said, if it, if it comes from a, if it comes from something with a face, it's probably not very good for you. Um, so <laughs> I'd never heard anyone say that before, but I've never forgotten it since. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's just something to keep in mind. And uh, the other thing he did tell her was uh, um, that, you know, you got to where you were right now, you know, having the heart attack, um, doing what you thought was healthy or the diet that you had. So maybe it's time for a change. Um, so this, <laughs> This is the time, as an aside, to tell you that medicine is not perfect, and this woman actually wasn't really having a heart attack. I'll put that, I found that out kind of you know a few hours later when a few of the tests came back again, but the, the message was still there. Um, okay. So anyway, so a sample daily menu basically of of 
of what uh, a vegetarian diet would look like. So breakfast, why, I mean, we've got a great example tonight, but, but going through, so a breakfast would be something like buckwheat pancakes with almond butter, sliced bananas, blueberries, cinnamon, and applesauce. I mean, right there, there's, there's plenty of flavor there, regardless of, you know, without, you can, you can imagine just with all those spices. I mean, there's, there's plenty of flavor there. Uh, for lunch, a burrito bowl with brown rice, beans, lettuce, tomato, avocado, lemon juice, and salsa, some red grapes, basically almost everything except for the meat that, that you would normally put in there. Uh, snack, things like uh, hummus and, and raw vegetables, um, a dinner with a kale and arugula salad, red cabbage, red onion, homemade oil, dairy-free Caesar dressing, and, or a polenta with eggplant, chickpeas, and spinach, and uh, this kind of thing. And then dessert, uh, strawberries. Uh, in this part, they put 100% cocoa powder, which, which I guess is okay in limited quantities. <laughs> Okay, so how does it work? That's basically what we kind of described before. It basically will, uh, the main thing that these kind of things do, especially when we're worried about heart disease, is the blood vessels. And that's what I was mentioning before. Um, the, main, the main reason that a lot of these things are risk factors for heart disease, like, like high blood pressure and diabetes, is because those things damage blood vessel walls. And, and that's what you see improve uh, very much, not just with those risk factors, but actually just not having those animal products as much in the system. Um, we, we, they found that the, the, the inflammation is actually hip with that. And that microbiome support, including the decreased uh, TMAO, that's the type, that, those are the type of things I was talking about where markers that have been found to, to damage blood vessels have been shown to be created by our normal gut bacteria when we eat meat products and, and basically break those things down. Um, and we, we get those as a result. So we want to emphasize again, whole minimally processed plant foods, and the reason why you oftentimes hear the, the term whole, uh, a whole food diet or, or a plant-based diet as opposed to vegan or that kind of term is because uh, the, the, the way it was described to me once was that you can be vegan and just sit there and eat Oreos all day. That's technically still, I mean, you're, you're still a vegetarian at that point in time, so we really want to get the thing that we're emphasizing plant-based foods, not, not just avoiding meat. That's not going to really get you anywhere if, if you don't uh, make other changes. So we want high and good stuff, as they say, and things like fiber, vitamins, minerals, healthy fats, as we mentioned, and then low and the bad stuff like saturated fats and, and salt um, and, and other things like that. And basically the opposite is, I know that slide often looks delicious to people there, but the, um, really it's sort of the opposite of what, uh, of what the last slide was, as far as what we're kind of looking for. So uh, Harvard did a meta-analysis a few years ago, which, which basically showed, and that was published in Circulation, which is a, a big time cardiology journal. Uh, that, that basically high processed meat, things like uh, um, hot dogs and, and uh, the salamis and things you see pictured basically in there, the processed meats give you about 42% higher risk of having heart disease, and, and I'm talking about heart attacks and that kind of, that kind of heart disease. Um, the follow-up study basically showed that it also is higher risk of type 2 diabetes, um, and that increased with the amount uh, that, you, uh, that you ate. Um, as far as the processed meat being even worse than regular red meat, uh, as far as that goes. And then the, uh, the, the third point there is talking about cancer and how, how these type of processed meats have also have a cancer risk associated with them. So completely separate from, from a cardiology talk, but nonetheless very important as far as health food goes. Um, these are a few points as far as consideration goes when people think about going into this sort of diet or, or, or getting dietary changes. And, and, it, and a lot of them has to do with how am I going to get my nutrients that I need. And, and there's ways to get that. And the, the, one of the main ones you see are how am I going to do it. So uh, eating the rainbow they mentioned here, variety is the key to make sure you get, get all the nutrients you need. B12 is really one of the only nutrients that is very difficult to get outside of, out of meat, but they do have uh, fortified foods, uh, fortified grains and cereals, plant-based foods that are, that, or, or supplements are also available for B12 in that point. So that's really kind of the one that, that often people think about. Uh, calcium is, is you, can more than, you can get enough calcium without eating all, all those sorts of things. That's, that's, not, that's not too difficult. Um, and then avoiding, you know, things that, that will decrease calcium, things like salts and, and, and caffeine and alcohol and that kind of thing. Uh, getting sun exposure for vitamin D and, uh, and iodine, another one which, which, you know, depending on how much salt you cut back, but, but it's not that difficult to get iodine as far as in, in, in normal foods these days. Okay, so um, I'm not going to get into this one too much, but this is just basically a list which, which you can look up online if you're interested, and that's just basically all the different vitamins and different, different plants and things you can get those vitamins from and different sources you can get them from. So, so it's, it's really, the way I put it out there is it's not really an excuse not to try to change a little bit about the diet. 
Okay, and then I, I don't want to get into this too much, but, but uh, climate change is all the rage these days, and for good reason. <laughs> and um, basically, as far as your carbon footprint, just, just cutting back on eating meats a little bit is just basically going to cut down on what we do to the earth. And, and that just has to do with the amount of, of land and, 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 and waste and things that come from, from having to raise, raise animals for that sort of thing. So basically what they're pointing out here is that the standard American diet basically is about two football fields of, of, uh, you know, of space for, for either animals or grains or that kind of thing will feed one person a year, as opposed to if we just cut out the animals completely, you'd get that same amount of space feeding about 14 people. So it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, this one kind of shocked me a little bit, so I, I was, it was news to me, so I really had to, had to include that here. Okay, and just a few resources as far as if anyone's interested besides just uh, using Dr. Google, which is something that I've heard a lot that, that, that people use, but uh, 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 Forks Over Knives, we mentioned a little bit before, it's a whole website, it's got a, it's, there's a documentary on Netflix about it that basically really gets into a uh, plant-based diet, which is a good thing to check out if you're, if you're curious. Um, there's plant-based research, nu nutrition facts, websites, but basically you can find a, uh, information about this all over the place now. It's, it's not difficult to find anymore. Um, so just a summary, that basically that we talked about in general, that diet plays a major role in health as we, as we discussed today. Um, Plant-based nutrition, we were talking about whole plant foods and we're trying to get rid of processed foods and animal products as much as we can. Um, it is a powerful health promoter and, and we can honestly use it to, to pre definitely prevent and in some cases even try to, try to treat some, some uh, diseases that have already, already made an appearance. Okay, so just, just wrapping it up, I just wanted to include a couple pictures that basically, so this is uh, from Harvard, put this out a, a few years ago where they're trying to basically add up the, the, the plates, and this is sort of more so the first type of diets we were talking about with the American Heart Association and the DASH. Um, so just emphasizing, you know, how much of your plate should, should be uh, reserved for what type of food. You can see completely half here is fruits and vegetables on, on this plate, just, just right there off the bat. And, and the main thing that gets overlooked in the corner is the water. And I want to emphasize that as much as we can to, to try to avoid sugary drinks or, or, and that sort of thing. And just drink, as, drink water if, as, as a substitute as much as you can. It's, you're going to do a whole lot better for yourself. Um, and then basically, the, and this is just another list of, of foods on the left that we're trying to encourage and foods that we're trying to, to uh, discourage and, and kind of replace. And the very first one is interesting because it's, it's vegetables and we're talking about without salt or uh, or rinsed vegetables as opposed to vegetables with sauces, which oftentimes will have, if you get them beforehand, will have a lot of salt or, or oils in, that, in the sauce itself, um, or fried, uh, fr fried vegetables, as you can imagine, kind of defeats the purpose in a lot of ways. And uh, basically going from there where we, we try to emphasize, you know, healthier fishes, fatty fishes like salmon and that sort of thing as opposed to, to other red meats and emphasizing beans and peas and sweet potatoes as opposed to French fries and white bread and regular potatoes and, and that sort of thing. Okay, and just lastly, I think this might be my last slide, just a few things that uh, people might have a few questions about these. These are a few recent sort of controversial foods um, that I found that the, that the American College of Cardiology was talking about, and, and, and this is based on the best recommendations we have now as far as uh, uh, the ones on the left are things that definitely have evidence of harm, and we want to try to limit or avoid them, and those include things with added sugars, as we mentioned. Um, sugary drinks and uh, energy drinks, especially when people drink a lot of energy drinks. That's, that's one of the first questions I ask somebody, especially I got a lot of pa patients with palpitations and these days one of the first things I have to ask people, especially young people, is, is are you drinking energy drinks and how many of them are you drinking a day? Um, the middle, pr the middle uh, category here is things that are kind of lacking in evidence right now for harm or benefit. You can't the, they, they don't have a powerful statement one way or the other, and dairy is a very uh, controversial in that way. There are some, definitely some good things about dairy, um, but the, the definitely the kind of the whole milk and the, the ones with the higher saturated fats are definitely ones I would say to try to avoid. Um, fermented foods and seaweed, uh, they're, they're, people are eating a lot more of now these days, and there's some, there's some data that it might be an improvement for, for heart health going forward. And then things that are definitely recommended uh, is, is things like uh, uh, legumes, beans, and peas. Moderate coffee consumption is okay, so is, so is tea. They might actually have some good things for your blood vessels there. Uh, mushrooms, vitamin B12 we, we talked about, uh, good fatty acids like omega-3s that are, we find in uh, uh, fish oils. And uh, alcohol does have some good effects as far as heart health goes. It is on the American, uh, American Cancer Society's list of cancer-causing carcinogens, so I can't 100% say everybody go out and just start drinking because that, 
it's got its own side effects. But for as far as heart health, moderate alcohol is probably okay, but you might ru you run into problems in different body systems with that. So it, it, it's not something I, I solidly recommend to people when they come and see me for sure. And uh, just, just some, some online resources, again, just anything you could look up to try to help you kind of get on track with, uh, with different uh, di uh, diets or, or, or websites that you can kind of interact and put data into, and it'll give you tips and that kind of thing. But um, any of these you, um, uh, you can find online for sure. Okay, that's all I had. Uh, any, if you guys have any questions or anything, I'll try to answer the best I can. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Doc. Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, because we are live streaming and so we can also uh, have an opportunity for everyone to hear the questions, uh, we have some mics. If you have a question, uh, just go ahead and raise your hand. And while you're thinking of some questions, uh, Doc, I don't mind uh, using myself as an illustration. I know that, uh, you know, there are, are, are HIPAA issues that would prevent you talking about others, but I'm here and I don't mind you talking. Um, you know, you, you shared when I went into your office, you showed because I do follow a whole food plant-based diet yep. and I do not use oil in my diet. I don't use any dairy or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and I remember that you plugged in the data of when I was practicing that kind of lifestyle, when my cholesterol was high, when my oh, blood yeah. pressure was yeah. high. Mm -hmm. And then you took the latest uh, uh, data that, that you had. And I think you said that I had cut my risk of a cardiovascular event by like 50%, is that? Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so that was um, what, what I mentioned early on in the talk about uh, in that, those 10 things that they recommend that the people like, that, that docs like me do when, when, when uh, people come to our offices. And one of them is that the risk calculator that the American Heart Association has now. And that's the one that involves the cholesterol and the, high, and the blood pressure and, and uh, you know, the age and gender and that kind of thing. And just, just plugging in his numbers as far as the, what the pressure was like and, and more importantly what the cholesterol looked like uh, spit me out a, uh, and I can't remember the numbers exactly, but his, his pre-weight uh, loss cholesterol or risk was uh, well over 10%. And, se and that's 10% in 10 years. So you have your risk of having an event in the next 10 years. And, and for him was about was was well over 10 percent and, and seven and a half percent is where they start coming down on me to say that you need to get this person on a cholesterol medicine no matter what their cholesterol is they, their risk is so high that we have to get that cholesterol as down as humanly possible and you drop so far below that um, or that 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 area that, that it wasn't even a consideration at that point in time and I remember it must have been down to something like three four percent or something and most of that risk just had to do with the fact that you're a man unfortunately with, with that that just flipping the man and woman cal on the calculator, you, you see the percent just drop, jump up. Uh, and sorry, guys. But uh, yeah, it, it goes up considerably. But, but most of it was just from that. So yeah, it was, it was a big change. Absolutely. So um, you know, I, I wanted to bring that up to, to, to uh, emphasize the fact um, f from my own changes that this is possible. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Reversal is possible. Absolutely. Reversal is possible. Mm -hmm. Any questions that you have? Yes, in the back there, Laura. Hello, doctor. Thank you for being here. Um, I just recently discovered I have a PFO, uh, which is, uh, for anybody else, a hole in your heart. Mm -hmm. um, my, um, my heart is enlarged. Does diet help that? Um, so yes and no. So the, the, the reason I would say that is, so first of all, a PFO, it, it's a hole in the, in the top part of the heart that's a normal thing that everybody in this room was born with having. 80% of us close that off as, as, as we get older. Uh, so about 20% of people have a PFO. So it's really like there are, there are a bunch of PFOs in this room right now that, that don't know that they have PFOs. And all a PFO means it's a patent foramen ovale. That's the name of the hole, the foramen ovale. And the reason why it's there is when, when we're uh, uh, in the womb, basically you, your lungs are filled with fluid and you don't breathe. So the, there's no way for the heart to send blood to the lungs. It's not gonna work. But it's, so it's gotta be able to get blood to the other side of the heart and get it to the whole body without having to put it through the lungs that aren't working. And that's what the PFO is for. So by itself, a PFO usually does not cause enlargement of, of the heart. It depends on kind of how big uh, the hole is, but usually, typically, it does not. If the heart's enlarged for other sorts of reasons, like, like, a, like a high blood pressure or that sort of thing, then that sort of thing is potentially kind of reversible if the cause is, is that. But, but it would sort of depend on what the cause of the enlarged heart is. So does AFib so that reason? AFib, so AFib is a, uh, um, AFib is an abnormal heart rhythm that you can see in enlarged hearts and sometimes it can cause an enlarged heart. 
Um, but that usually you don't, you, you don't there's, I don't think there's a great relationship as far as having a PFO and getting AFib, but the AFib itself can definitely lead to an enlarged heart then, but that's a sort of a separate issue than the PFO. Uh, with AFib, diet can certainly help AFib. Yes, yes, diet, weight loss, uh, uh, alcohol, um, uh, sleep apnea is a big thing that's very underdiagnosed uh, in, today's, um, uh, uh, in today's society in general, and which is a big thing that can cause AFib, it can cause high blood pressure, it can cause daytime being tired all day, that sort of thing, and, and that's definitely something that, so there's, de for AFib, absolutely, all those things, those things definitely help with AFib. Uh, the PFO, and, the, and the, not, not really, but that's not something that you really need treatment for, usually, unless there's something kind of else happens. Another question. Anyone else with another question? Yes, right here. Hi. Um, I was just recently in the hospital for a renal failure. I mean, I was in for months and months. And I quit drinking coffee like years ago. And my gastroenterologist told me that I should drink at least three cups of coffee a day because it would help my liver. Have you ever heard of that? Um, vaguely, I will say, but, but I, I wouldn't want to comment on, on that either way. I just don't know enough about that specifically. Um, okay. I would say if he told you to do it, there must be a reason behind I mean, I, yeah, but I, I can't answer that one way or the other. I would hate to give you just something that would be my yeah. best guess. Well, I'm doing really, really well. I learned how to walk again. Anna's my neighbor. She, she watched me go from my deathbed to... I'm here now, so. Well, that's amazing. Very that's good. good to hear. I, and I did have to change my diet. Well, go, uh, so I'm, I just asked her, do fish have faces? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not allowed to eat red meat, pork, duck, turkey, okay. any of those, but I eat a lot of fish. That's, that, look, that's okay. I mean, look, the I, reason I present these diets is not to say that, you know, one is a lot better than the other. It's just that these are, these are all recommended by, by the American Heart Association. And, they, okay. and any sort of <laughs> shift that you can make in your diet to go towards one of these, it doesn't have to be completely, but any shift is gonna be helpful. Okay, we've got another question right here. I would like to know the difference between a B12 shot and a B12 tablet. So that's a great question. B12 shot is a much higher dose of, 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 the, of the B12 that, that is technically supposed to be able to last for a period of time, um, as opposed to the B12 tablet, which is often something you have to take daily. Yeah, it, because it's a protein, the stomach breaks down a lot of that, and that's why a lot of times the shot is, what, uh, is uh, uh, things that you usually have to give in shots, like proteins and insulin and things like that, or, or, or sorry, um, B12 and, in, and insulin and these type of things are, are, are things that are not, are not as well absorbed in the stomach. So it, it, but either way, you, you can uh, supplement B12 either way. The shot is something that is a uh, more dramatic thing. Often we give it when somebody is B12 deficient. Um, I do think that, that these days it seems like B12 shots are given a little too often in my, in my medical opinion as far as, you know, if you're deficient in B12, I think it's one thing. If you need it, it's one thing. Um, routine B12 is not something I typically would recommend if somebody has okay B12 levels. Um, but yeah, so not much of a difference, but it's more of the dose and the amount of times you have to kind of take the, the, the medication. Okay, uh, yes, I see another question back here. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, question pertaining to women, postmenopausal, does hormone replacement, is that helpful? for the heart, and my second question, I've heard that if you're postmenopausal, you shouldn't be having all the soy products. Is there any truth to that? Um, so I haven't heard much about the second one. I, so I, I, I can't say that for sure now. Now, I don't wanna be, if somebody has a strong opinion about that and they know a little bit more than I do about the nutrition of soy, then I, I would like to hear it, but I, I haven't really heard much of that. The first one is probably it's a little cardioprotective as far as that goes because we do notice that when menopause happens, the, the, the protective effects, estrogen has a protective effect on, on heart health. And when you go through menopause, you basically lose that and your risk approaches, approaches a male risk at that point in time. Um, so yes, it probably does a little bit, but uh, again, then, then but as, as I was mentioning with other foods, it brings problems with other body systems, and, and that with, with cancer risks and things like that with, with long-term hormone therapy is something that we, that we often worry about. So um, for the heart, though, yeah, it probably, it probably helps a little bit. Uh, there was another question right over here, and then 
Over there is one, a question back over there. So uh, right here in the front, right here in the front. Just a real quick question. I read a book years ago, Vitamin E, Your Key to a Healthy Heart. And I'm wondering if you know, is there any truth in that? I th supplement, I in fact, vitamin supplements in general. So that, that's a great question. So I'm glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned the second part also. So vitamin E for, for a number of years was one of the things that we re they really kind of pushed for a lot of different things. I, I, the evidence isn't terrific now as far as, you know, for, for heart health, if it really is. I, I never recommend people taking vitamin E specifically as, as a supplement. Uh, vitamins in general, most people don't need. If you eat a decent diet, and I'm t you, you don't need vitamin supplementations, unless, and that's where I push, now I don't, if someone tells me they take a multivitamin, I don't tell them to stop by any means, but I, but I also, I don't, it's not something I go out and say, oh, you should be taking a multivitamin for sure. Now, if you are, um, you know, when, when we start worrying about if there's certain conditions you need it, for example, if you have low bone density and we need to take supplemental vitamin D and calcium, that's one thing, that's you're treating a condition or you're, you're trying to treat something that, that's there. If you have blood tests, and they've shown that you're deficient in a certain vitamin, then by all means, you need to take that vitamin. Um, but as far as just run-of-the-mill taking vitamins, it's, it's uh, especially in the U.S., they're very, it's not very common to, to be vitamin deficient to have to take supplements, but, but I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay, another question over here, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, my, my electrolytes, I drink water, I drink tea, I used to drink Gatorade. Uh, how do I get my electrolytes back? Because I don't want to do Gatorade anymore. What um... Else? So there, that, that, that's, that's great. That's a good question. So there are, uh, um, there, there are uh, like certain recipes. You can sort of make home Gatorade a little bit with electrolytes and it involves like some, some baking soda and a, a few other things that you could basically kind of add in there to simulate it without getting a lot of the sugar. So easily, uh, I, would, I would just kind of Google that and, and you, could, you can find something to take with that. But for the most part, unless you're really, really straining and, and if you're doing heavy exercise, then yeah, by all means. But for normal run of the day stuff, even if you just exercise a, you know, a normal run or something like that, water is usually just fine in that case. You, your body doesn't typically get that deficient in electrolytes. I mean, unless you're, if you're, if you're really, really pushing it and, you, and, and you're, uh, especially if you're, I mean, if you're a professional athlete and those guys are that fine. But uh, very often that's, uh, <laughs> that's um, uh, something that we try not, uh, or, uh, yeah, sorry, but there are ways that you can mix certain things like that. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Doc. We really appreciate you uh, being here. And, uh, you know, if any of you have any other quick questions you want to talk to him about afterwards, I'm sure he might be able, but he does have to go get his wife, so <laughs> we don't want to let him forget that. And we have something, we have something that we want to give you, Doc so that you can oh, remember, wow. see me fit. Oh, We're so gonna cool. give you one of these aprons. Thank you. So that awesome. when you uh, and your wife are cooking in the kitchen that you can uh, remember to re maintain uh, see me I, fit. I really, this is really cool and I really appreciate it and I can already picture her face as me, this is basically I get in the way in the kitchen and uh, just me wearing this, getting in her way, I can already picture her face and it, it'll, be, it'll be really funny. So Great. I'm, I'm very happy about Thank it. you so much, Doc, for coming. We really, really appreciate Thank this you. so much. Thank you. Go put on that uh, wedding ring and, and get yeah. your wife. <laughs> so one, one thing that um, Elaine brought to my attention today, did you know that CNN announced today that Disney has now stated that they are going to have vegan options at all of their food restaurants? And that's a huge statement. I mean, people are becoming more conscious about healthy, um, nutritional food. And hopefully vegan is more than just Coke, potato chips, and Oreo cookies. So, yeah, that's right. Hey, folks, listen, uh, conscientious of your time. I know we went a little over tonight, but I do want to let you know that tonight is the, uh, was the last night in our sequence of, of See Me Fit and that we will uh, be launching again in 2020. Uh, but before the end of the year, uh, Jan and I will be announcing... Uh, another uh, potluck that we will be having, uh, probably as we get closer. Yes, but I was going to mention that. Yes, as we get closer to the holidays, and we're not just calling it, in fact, we are not using the term vegan for obvious reasons that he explained tonight, um, and uh, we call it the herbivore exchange. Uh, that is our, our uh, healthy potluck that we will be having, the herbivore exchange. I handed out to you while uh, the doctor was lecturing 
something that is really, really important, folks. Coming up, See Me Fit is going to present this while we are done for the season we, uh, with our Tuesday evening uh, presentation. We do have, uh, starting th this weekend, a special weekend uh, with Dr. Wes Youngberg. Many of you have heard of Wes Youngberg. Uh, he was the one who uh, developed the Diabetes Undone program, but uh, he has many, many other things that he does. He um, has the Youngberg uh, Lifestyle and Nutrition Clinic in Temecula. He's helped many, many people uh, turn their lives around, and, and I'm personally a testimony uh, to uh, the work of, of Dr. Youngberg because it was implementing uh, his ideas and his principles through the Diabetes Undone program that changed my life. Uh, even though I was not diabetic, I was in the advanced pre-diabetes stage. He will be presenting this weekend, Goodbye Diabetes, Heart Disease, and Alzheimer's, Preventing and Reversing Chronic Disease the Natural Way. And, uh, you know, he will be talking about how Alzheimer's is becoming known as the new type 3 diabetes. Um, so we want to encourage you to be here. Dr. Youngberg um, is, um, he's not real easy to get a hold of. Um, he has a very, very busy schedule, and I feel very fortunate that we were able to, to land him here in uh, Simi Valley this coming weekend. He will be with us Friday evening, 7 o'clock, um, Saturday morning at 11 a.m., followed by a heart-healthy buffet luncheon that we will be serving. He'll be doing a Q&A session in the after, early afternoon, followed by a 5.30 presentation. We'll give you a break uh, that you can enjoy the afternoon and how reversing prediabetes undoes the main causes of all chronic disease. Say goodbye to heart disease and lower your cancer risk dramatically at 5.30 p.m. So we encourage you to come. You'll find this really beneficial. Um, I will tell you that uh, Dr. Youngberg, uh, for his services this weekend, um, it's, it's not free. He is, it's very expensive, but I'm telling you this to let you know that it's not going to cost you anything because we're providing this as a community service uh, to people here in our area. So there is no charge uh, for Dr. Youngberg, but normally if you go to hear him, you can pay a very hefty price uh, to hear him. So we look forward to seeing you on Friday evening and Saturday uh, for this special event. Then I want to mention also that on Monday, the 7th of October, we launch our next Diabetes Undone program. And um, it's eight sessions and an incredibly powerful presentation. Diabetes Undone was uh, one of the key things that helped me make my uh, extreme lifestyle changes that um, I found to be sustainable. No gimmicks, uh, heart healthy stuff. And uh, Dr. Uh, Youngberg was the one who developed uh, this. You don't have to be a diabetic to take it, okay? So I want to encourage you to consider that. And um, anyway, uh, we thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you on uh, Friday evening if you can make it. And um, so uh, I want to say one last thing. I have some tickets uh, that I can give to any of you that may be interested in a musical um, developed by some friends of mine who is he's also a cardiologist and his wife is a professional musician. Um, they uh, are really amazing people. They follow uh, a healthy uh, plant-based diet, and um, they were the ones that produced the, uh, the video testimony that some of you have seen uh, of my lifestyle changes. Um, they are offering something known as the Ten Commandments musical this Sunday evening at 5 o'clock uh, in Glendale, and a really powerful presentation with some great musicians uh, from across the country that are putting on uh, this great thing called Love at Work, um, the Ten Commandment musical. Um, I have some tickets for any of you that may be interested in. I'd, I'd be happy to share a few free tickets. Those are free, uh, but you must have a ticket to go. Thank you so much for coming, uh, folks. And uh, if you are interested in the Diabetes Undone program, please see Jan, and uh, she'll get you on that pre-registration list. So thank you. God bless, and thank you for coming.